he doesn't. He is what he is. And he is today what he always has been. And what he always has been and is today, he always will be. That's our God. That's Jehovah. And just for what he is like, embodied in his name, Jehovah, we should bless him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless Jehovah. Because he's the only one like this. There is no other one like him. This verse as well, verse 1, says, All that is within me, bless his, what's the next word? Holy name. We should bless God for his holiness. That's what sets him apart. Now you look at the Greek mythology. You look at the, the Norse mythology. You look at that, and those, those gods that they created out of their own imaginations, were they holy? No, they were running to the extreme of our fleshliness, weren't they? Multiple paramours, loves. I mean, they, they had all sorts of addictions. They were like a worse picture of ourselves, just on a level that was imagined to be divine but not this one. He is truly, through and through, holy, which means entirely separate from sin. Habakkuk 1.13 says that he is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and he cannot look on iniquity. That's God. That's our God, the one with whom we have to do. He cannot even look on iniquity, and certainly cannot overlook iniquity and just smile at it or wink at it. James 1.13 says that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Evil has no attraction for him. Does it for you? Unfortunately, it does for me. It does for us, but not for God. It has no appeal to him whatsoever. He is holy, entirely separate from sin. Holy is his name. And therefore, we should bless him. And also, on this theme of blessing him for what he is, another part of the revelation of this verse, look down at verse 8. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. What do these words mean? This is almost a verbatim quotation from Exodus 34.6. If you'll think of Exodus 34.6, think of the context. Two chapters earlier, Moses had been up on the mount getting the Ten Commandments that God wrote on the two tablets, and he had to leave. God said, you need to get down. Why did he have to get down? Because of the golden calf, right? because that was going on in the camp of Israel. They had given up on Moses, and in fact, given up on Jehovah. And so they formed a golden calf and said, look at the gods who brought you out of Egypt, Israel. Let's worship them. And so that was going on, and God said, go down to the camp. They have already rejected me. So Moses goes down, and he, he cleanses it. He confronts it, and then he goes back to get the law again. And God puts Moses, Moses in the cleft of the rock because Moses has said, show me your glory. And God said, you can't look at, at me full front and live. But I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll cover the edge of that over with my hand, and I'll pass by, and then I'll remove my hand so you can just see the train of my glory, the hinder parts, the glow that follows. And as he does that, God himself tells Moses what he's like, and he says almost these exact same words. He is merciful. He's long-suffering. He is plenteous in mercy. He gives forgiveness. And in the context of the golden calf, isn't it a blessing he's merciful and long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and forgiveness? In context of where we live, isn't it a blessing he's merciful? And the word merciful here, to, to explain what it means, because it's easy to misunderstand it, but there's a depth of meaning beyond what we normally would take it as we just read that word. The Lord is merciful. The word, it's only used 13 times in the Old Testament. So this isn't the normal word used for mercy or merciful. And it's eight of those times it's translated merciful. Five of those times it's translated compassionate or compassion. What it means is that God, and perhaps if you get nothing more from this message today than this, what this word merciful means is that God is emotionally moved toward his children. God is emotionally moved to you, if you know him, to me, as I know him. Is that amazing? That a God who sits on the throne of the universe, who didn't have to have us, who created us for his own glory, that he would even know we exist, and that he would even care that we exist, and then that he would care for us individually, 
and be emotionally moved toward us. That's God. And because of his mercy, because he is merciful, compassionate toward his own, we should bless him with all that we are. Verse 8 goes on and says he is merciful. He is gracious. He is gracious. He reaches out to us in spite of our being undeserving. Isn't that a blessing? We don't deserve it. And he knows that. But he extends grace because that's what he is. He is gracious to us. Though he doesn't wink at sin, though sin must be paid for, there is a penalty attached that he proclaimed. But he is gracious, reaching out to us in spite of our being undeserving. And then it says he is slow to anger or long-suffering or patient. Those are different ways this word is translated. Again, it means that he restrains the wrath that is just. Israel that day, when they, they were cavorting in front of the golden calf, they deserved to be wiped off the face of the earth, didn't they? But he restrained it. He was long-suffering. He was patient. You and I, today, if we got what we deserve, where would we be? I would be in hell at this moment. But God is long-suffering. He is patient. He restrains the wrath that is just. I earned it. But in his long-suffering, he was patient with me. And he was gracious to me. Then the next phrase says he is plenteous in mercy. Plenteous, that means abounding. When you think, have I just gone past the point of forgiveness? Have I just sinned in that same old way that my flesh goes again and again? Have I ex- ex- you know, exhausted God's mercy? It says he is plenteous. He is abounding He has more than enough for all of us and for all of our sins. He is plenteous in mercy, abounding in mercy, an abundant store of a love that never changes. He doesn't change toward you. He doesn't change to me. And aren't you thankful? I change in my love to him. Sometimes I'm closer to him. Sometimes I'm further away because I'm loving my flesh more than I'm loving my God. But even then, he is the same an unchanging, a steadfast love, and he is plenteous, abounding in it. So because of all that he is, what should we do? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Because of all he is, but then, because of all he does and has done for us, we should bless God with all that we are. You know, many times, we judge God by the worst person we know. I, talk, I deal a lot with teenagers. And some of them, as you said, you know, they can sniff out a fake. Some of them, unfortunately, live with fakes, um, have had an opportunity to examine a fake close up. And so m- some, many of them will say, you know what, if that's a Christian, I don't want any part of that God. We judge God by the worst person we know, right? We say, if that's what his children look like, I don't want to be anything like him. But in reality, when we look at this chapter, God is better than the best we can imagine. So let's stop comparing him with the worst we know and using that as some kind of excuse to get out of serving and loving him and obeying him. And look at who he is. Then we have no excuse. In fact, if we look at who he is, then with all of our heart and mind and soul for all of our days, we will serve him and love him. And that's our right response. Because of all he's done now, we should bless God with all that we are. First of all, what has he done? Look at how he's handled our sins. Let's bless him because of that. That's what the psalmist says. Look with me down at verses um, 2. We'll read 2 through 4, and then we'll jump down to verse 9. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. But before we start thinking benefits, what's in my pocket, what's in my driveway, what's in my household, he says, you know what, let's start with the really important benefits. Verse 3, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Down to verse 9, he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. 
We should bless God.